My name's Chris Stewart. I'm the founder of a company called Shirtbits. Uh, so, you know, I, I know I'm supposed to be talking about DLCs and TapScript, but unfortunately, uh, the Taproot implementation in Bitcoin S is not done for PubPy. I was waiting through the joyous BIP that uh, Lisa was talking about, BIP 341 and 342, and I'm still implementing the set of static test vectors that Bitcoin Core puts out there. Um, so during these hackathons, I will be doing that. If you guys have any questions about those nitty gritty low level implementation details, I can uh, try and answer them for you. Um, but so sorry, sorry to disappoint. But uh, what I'm going to talk about today is just like where discrete log contracts are at in development. Um, how many people have heard of DLCs before? Okay, most of the people in the room, how many people have done DLCs before? Okay, significantly less people in the room. My goal for this conference is to convert people from the have heard of camp to have done a DLC camp. So the topic that I'm going to go through today is just showing everybody like kind of what the state of the DLC um, ecosystem looks like from a UI perspective, and then also talk about some specification level uh, stuff about DLCs. Um, very similar to the Lightning Network, uh, DLCs also have an open specification that anybody can join and implement if they would like. Um, this is what our DLC wallet looks like currently. Uh, you can see up in the um, top here is like information about the return profile of my DLCs. I haven't been very profitable with the DLCs that I've been doing. I've lost uh, about a quarter million sats and uh, the rate of return on my DLCs is 15%. What you should be thinking of like with this is, you know, this is like kind of the purpose of DLCs is to bring this DeFi to Bitcoin. I mean, you can be a good speculator in the DeFi ecosystem or you can be a bad speculator in, in, in this wallet. I haven't been a very good speculator. Um, I know I've got 45 minutes as well. I forgot to mention this up front, but I am happy to take questions throughout uh, the uh, talk because I prefer to yeah, engage, I guess, with the audience and answer questions as they pop up. Um, any questions right now? Okay, we'll keep moving along. So like down here in the table is the actual individual DLCs that I have done. So you can see here is like the Mumbai Indians versus the Chennai Super Kings. I did this with uh, an Indian uh, contributor um, to the DLC ecosystem. That was a sports bet on, um, you know, a, I think it was a cricket match that was going on. Yeah. You can see why my return is so bad. I'm speculating on Indian cricket matches. I, you know, I think it's pretty good that I'm only down 15% personally. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, we got we got like, you know, random things that I, I've speculated on. The Super Bowl is another uh, very popular one um, that we were doing DLCs based on. Uh, I think the Super Bowl was actually here in Los Angeles. It was the Los Angeles Rams versus the Cincinnati Bengals. And uh, it looks like with these, I sorry, I can't blow this up because it is a screenshot, but um, the rate of return on these was, you know, negative 50,000 sats is what it says over here. And the rate of return is a ne uh, negative 100%. So I lost all my money in that DLC. Um, we also, uh, I, you can do things like bet on the U.S. election. I very infamously did uh, presidential election bet with Nicholas Dorier back in 2020 in like the very nascent stages of DLCs where I put up uh 0.6 Bitcoin that Joe Biden was going to win the election. He put up 0.4 Bitcoin that Donald Trump was going to win the election. And uh, that one actually worked out in favor of me, but did have a little drama along the way. Uh, you know, good thing. Another important rule about DLCs is don't settle them too early unless there's a <laughs> clear and apparent outcome. As you know, I guess everybody knows that election was a little contentious and it took a while to uh, iron out uh, what was going on there. So. Um, you know, being an Oracle, a responsible Oracle operator is very important in DLCs. And that's kind of like where, um, you know, the entire DLC ecosystem revolves around. Um, any questions so far, far comments? For the yeah. Oracles, these are all single Oracles? Or yes. Multi, multi -oracle you, uh, no, that doesn't count. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Um, so uh, multi-Oracle is supported at the protocol level. The problem that we have with multi, well, we have kind of multiple problems. It's like, first off, resource-wise, we're just trying to get the single Oracle stuff working really well before we broaden out to the multi-Oracle. 
um, use cases. Um, and that that's uh, you know, you, the primary reason that we only expose a single Oracle stuff via the UI, but it is baked into that open source specification that I have mentioned. And we do intend to um, push that forward because as uh, bets get larger, like most of these bets are like, you know, 100,000 sats, you know, roughly 30, 40 bucks. That's not anything too substantial. However, if you imagine you're like a country doing a DLC to like hedge your price risk to Bitcoin, um, you start caring about that a lot more than um, these the smaller DLCs. Make sense? Yeah. So for the guys like at Atomic, they're just using a single Oracle, yeah. but they're acting as the Oracle. Uh, we're acting as, as the Oracle, actually. Oracle. So um, good segue. So these like Deribit uh, DLCs that you see here in the table are actually the same Oracle that the Atomic Finance guys use. And uh, we have two types of DLCs. There's the enum DLCs, which is like for sporting events, elections, like things that can be easily enumerated that like, you know, Joe Biden's going to win or Donald Trump's going to win or there's going to be some sort of mutiny or something going on in the U.S. Or with the Super Bowl, the Cincinnati Bengals are going to win. The L.A. Rams are going to win. Maybe it could be a tie. Or you should always have like an act of God uh, carve out because, uh Let's say like the Super Bowl got canceled because of COVID or, you know, God forbid, something else worse. Like from an Oracle perspective, you do need to have something to sign in the case that, uh, uh, you know, un unforeseen circumstances did happen. You know, our world did change a couple of years ago with the COVID stuff. And a lot of people in the legal world had to go review their contracts to make sure they could get out of uh, um, agreements that they had in 2022. So from an Oracle's perspective, it does have a lot of parallels to kind of like writing legal contracts. So, make sense? Yeah. Okay. Right. Last question. Are they, you say you have to enumerate all of these different cases. Like, what's kind of like the limitation that you see right now in terms of like how many of these you could like go through? You could probably like list out 20 or 30. I don't know if there's like really a limit, but it just like when you get to the numeric cases, um, you know, we're like in the numeric cases for this Deribit Oracle that we're talking about, you could, the Oracle can accurately attest from prices in the range of zero dollars to two hundred sixty-two thousand dollars. So um, that means uh, there's two hundred sixty-two thousand possible outcomes because you know you, the Oracle needs to be able to tell like what was the Bitcoin price on a specific date, and that just is way too much to list out into a list. So I mean. I don't know if there is like a hard and fast limit. I don't believe in the protocol. We limit that currently. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it will like eventually start to cause issues. I need to think about that more now that I'm talking about it. So <laughs> thanks for the food for thought. Um, anyone else? Okay, we'll keep moving on. Uh, so like here are the components of a DLC. Like there's kind of three components to build a DLC. The very first thing is you need is an Oracle to attest to the thing that you're interested in. You were kind of just talking about this um, before. You know, if uh, Roman and I want to bet on some something very obscure that not a lot of other people know about, we need to go and source an Oracle somewhere to you know att attest to the thing that we're interested in. Uh, maybe we end up paying an Oracle to go attest to this really obscure thing because it's not a piece of information that's easy to obtain from like, you know, going to like ESPN.com or some news site to figure out who won the election or uh, going to one of the various Bitcoin exchanges to get their market uh, data for, for the Oracle. Um, uh, the other things are a contract template. So a contract template is the piece of information that specifies the uh, financial terms and conditions, who gets what money in uh, this contract that we're doing. So going back to the US election example, like the contract template for Nicholas and I would have been, uh, okay, Chris gets one Bitcoin if Joe Biden wins, uh, Nicholas gets one Bitcoin if Donald Trump wins. If it's a tie or an act of God, they get refunded their initial collateral. So I would get my 0.6 back, Nicholas would get his 0.4 back. Um, and then it also stipulates how much money you're putting into the contract too. And our, the amount of money that we contributed to this contract was not even because, um, the odds weren't even for the U.S. presidential election at that time. Uh, Joe Biden was a favorite to win the election when we entered into the bet. So I put up more money. I put up 0.6 Bitcoin. 
and he only put up 0.4 Bitcoin to represent that reality of Donald Trump was less likely to win that election. Um, makes sense of what a contract template is. Yes. The fee to pay the Oracle. Great, great question. Um, it is included in the funding output for the DLC. So the fees are paid for upfront on the settlement transactions or the contract execution transactions is what we call them in DLC world. Um, you can, of course, you know, do things like child pays for parent to also expedite, uh, or I guess if you committed too low of a fee, because you are guessing what the fee market will be in the future and you can't guess wrong. Yeah. So. Make sense? Yeah. Cool. So we got the contract template that just specifies the terms and conditions. And then the final thing you need is a counterparty to your contract, you know, finding somebody to take the other side of the bet and then build the DLC using the contract template for your specific wallet. The contract template is agnostic to various Bitcoin wallets. It can be used in anybody's Bitcoin wallet. There is no wallet specific information in a template. However, once you get to step three here is when you start adding things like your UTXOs for your specific wallet, you know, pointing your counterparty to yeah, where your funds are at on the blockchain and you begin building the transaction specific for your bet. Um, good so far? Cool. So yeah, what is an Oracle? We already kind of covered this, but it's someone that attests to real world events with cryptographic commitments associated to them. Uh, you, like I said before, uh, finding an Oracle for your specific bet is a problem. We do have a website for this. It's, we call it the Oracle Explorer. You can see it at oracle.suredbits.com. If you go there, you'll see a list of different Oracles for various uh, DLCs that people are doing. But uh, this is a tool meant to aid in aid people finding their Oracles. Or if you are an Oracle, you can publish it to oracle.shirtbits.com so other people can find it. Oracle discovery is not something that's taken care of natively in the DLC protocol. So you need to go to a third party site or just have a friend that you know is a consistent Oracle. Everyone good here? Cool. Here's like what some of these Oracles look like on the Oracle Explorer if you go to it. Um, <laughs> uh, so the top one is just a Bitcoin price one. You can see uh, the expiration was, you know, June 1st, 2021, so a little over a year ago. And the Bitcoin price is, is a, at that time was $36,000 that times. Um, announcements. <laughs> so uh, another like random one that was on there is like Will Citadel Dis Dispatch, which is a podcast uh, on 420. Uh -huh. um, exceed 2.5 hours, I guess. That did go longer than 2. .5. Yeah, it's a long podcast. Uh, I don't know. And then the, the final one is, you know, the, the cat lady and the, the weight of her Burmese cat in grams on uh, May 7th, 2021. It was 3,600 grams in case anybody wanted to know and bet on that. So, um, you know, you, the, the point of this slide is just to show there's a whole wide range of like things that you can, you know, make oracles for and go find oracles for. And you're uh, kind of uh, demusing what people put on there and uh, see what people are betting on. Everyone good here? Cool. How do you become an Oracle? So we have Oracle software that we provide. If this is something that's of interest to you, um, it's called Crystal Bowl. If you have an Umbrel, you can go download this from the Umbrel App Store. We have a um, desktop version of this too. You can go get that from sharedbits.com slash crystal bowl. And you can also build it from source. Uh, this is all open source. Um, you can find the instructions here on bitcoinhouse.org. Like I said at the beginning, I've tweeted out these slides. So if you're interested in this stuff and want to go like play around with this stuff, uh, you know, look at those, look at those slides on my Twitter, which is Chris underscore Stewart underscore five. What's up? So no, you are there is no cost to being an Oracle now. Um, we have in the past thought about doing what we call the staking address for an Oracle, which means uh, they could put up, you know, a certain amount of funds to prove that they're trustworthy. Um, and if the Oracle was to then equivocate 
to what they said. So they may have said that Joe Biden and Donald Trump won the election. There's no world that we live in where Joe Biden could have won the election and Donald Trump could have won the election. That would have revealed their private key to that staking address. So somebody else could go and sweep those funds that uh, the Oracle had staked. The reason we've moved away from this is because um, of practical ones. Why wouldn't the Oracle just spend his funds from his staking address right before he goes and equivocates? And then you can like go down the route of like, well, why don't we lock, put a lock time on the staking address or something like that? But it still ends up having this race condition. And frankly, we were like, well, let's spend time elsewhere just to try and get this stuff more usable to you know end users is kind of the choice that we made. Does that does that make sense? Yeah. It, it is reputation based. And another thing that we uh, hope the Oracle Explorer can provide is a way to track oracles over the long term and see like, hey, this person's been doing a good job. They didn't show up yesterday. You know, there seems to be other people using them. Maybe I can use that as a little bit of a signal that uh, this is more trustworthy. Um, another thing is like the multi Oracle stuff helps mitigate that risk as well, even though it's not usable today. Um, we do want to get it to that point to be usable to mitigate some more of that trust. But I mean, at the end of the day, the Oracle problem is the Oracle problem and it's not really solvable. You can just, uh, um, do your best to mitigate risk with oracles. Make sense? Cool. Uh, so this is like what Crystal Bowl looks like if you were to, you know, want it, want to be an oracle. Um, let's see if this actually works. Is my screen still shared? Uh, this is what my crystal bowl like looks like here on my own machine. It's uh, this is courtesy of Ben Carmen is the, <laughs> the laser eyes. Um, you can see a bunch of things that I've attested to in uh, you know my list here, a bunch of uh, price information. Um, let's see, what's an interesting one to look at? Here's like one in the software development process. I said does like the 1.8 release work with this commit hash and I. Uh, actually tried it out. Uh, this is the running example I'm going to have for you guys uh, during PlugFi. Um, you know, will this team win the LA PlugFi hackathon? And then I would go sign this outcome, yes, no, tie if uh, if they did win it. But now that I'm looking at my time, I'm done with 11, right? Okay, um, let's let's keep moving on here so we can cover more ground. But anyway, the, the point of this is, is like, this is what Crystal Bowl looks like. This is the Oracle application. Okay. Uh, and then if we were going to create an announcement, uh, this is what the screen looks like. You type in like what the name of the thing is. Like, again, like I said, will team the hacks or win the LA Pled by hackathon? Like, when is it over? So it's, I think the hackathon's over tomorrow. And then what are the outcomes? It's like, yes, they could win the hackathon. No, they could not win the hackathon. It could be maybe a tie. I don't know. Um, those are the outcomes that I could think of anyway. Everybody good here? Uh, I do not have one in these slides. I can, it, the, let's just wait just a moment, okay? Uh, this is what it looks like on the Oracle Explorer. If, so you can go see this at oracle.shirtbits.com and then you can obtain the announcement to start building a DLC. You need the Oracle to then go and start building those contract templates that I was talking about. Um, so on to the contract templates. Now that we've got an Oracle, we've got some testing to who's going to win this plug by hackathon. We can start building a contract around that Oracle. Contract templates you, you use for your DLC just contain the payouts, who gets what, when, and uh, the Oracle's used for that, uh, that contract. And then uh, here is like what an example contract looks like for that announcement that I just created. Um, you know, the description is 50k sats for this, uh, you know, this hacking team. The event is, you know, will they, they win this LA plug by hackathon? And then here's how the money div divvied up. So like, if they do win, this person's going to get 50,000 sats. If they do not win, this person's going to get zero sats. If it's a tie for whatever reason, they're going to get their initial money back. So it's just enumerating where the money is going if the Oracle does attest to a specific outcome. Everybody good? 
So for that contract, that's it's not because so if they're splitting it between two, then how are you signing those contracts beforehand? Like that's just like there's like two separate transactions with Oracle like preparing beforehand. Um, so the Oracle actually is totally agnostic of all the bets that use them. They're, they're totally oblivious. So it could be zero people using this Oracle. It could be a hundred thousand people that are using this Oracle from the Oracle's perspective. Those cases are exactly the same. They do not interact with any of the specific Bitcoin network information. More broadly, this Oracle could be used on the Bitcoin network, the Bitcoin cash network, the Litecoin network, the whatever yeah the or, and like this is a but a very important design uh goal of us in the dlc ecosystem is to keep the oracles as blockchain agnostic as possible because there's really no need for an oracle to go and be on chain so that's why we have these like websites and stuff for people to go find oracles because uh yeah the oracles do not touch the blockchain at all with the small caveat, if they use that staking address that we were just talking about, that would be the only time that they're doing something with the Bitcoin network is uh, maybe staking funds if they wanted to prove their reputation. Yeah. My understanding is that after the um so i i don't want to say it doesn't make any sense because like I, like as i opened up this talk like i'm actually in the middle of implementing taproot and like kind of learning how it works like firsthand now so um i'd say i'm a little green on the hands-on tap taproot side of things uh, but what we do try and do with oracles is use adapter signatures rather than bitcoin scripting language so that this stuff is just done kind of nice nice and atomically with some secrets that the oracle reveals when they attest to who won or you know who won the game or who won the election or what the bitcoin price is so we do try and avoid the scripting language of bitcoin when possible because it's just it's not as elegant as uh, being able to do things in a cryptographic way. Um, so and then the final component of the DLC is a counterparty for your contract. So and then this is like where like the rubber starts really hitting the road in terms of the hard things to solve with DLCs, in my opinion. Um, you need a counterparty for your DLC, someone to take the other side of the bet. This is an active area of research of how to do this in a trust minimized way uh, you know that that isn't a custodied environment and you know controversial opinion that i have is this is something that eth and other altcoins actually have an advantage at this is because they can host the market itself on the blockchain and you know the in, inside of you as a bitcoin developer should be like writhing a little bit being like oh that's nasty and gross and you shouldn't do things like that on the blockchain and it's like yes yes it's true um, however, I think most people in the Bitcoin ecosystem don't look at the advantages to doing something like that. And I think the number one advantage is it's just the regulatory ambiguity. So they could actually launch a product without having a central third party to go and sue um, necessarily. So uh, it would be nice to have something, you know, some the ability to do matchmaking in a decentralized way with Bitcoin. But that's something we don't have currently and uh, hopefully that can be uh i mean i i think it's a, a research problem at least worth taking seriously um did everything i say there make sense or any other questions on kind of that blurb nobody's gonna throw something at me for saying something nice about other currencies <laughs> um yeah so you guys should try this out like download the bitcoin s wallet it's self-custody can be used with neutrino or the bitcoin d backend um we have some docs again on the bitcoin s org website of like how to actually set this up and we can you can also just run docker uh I, i've actually misspelled this but a, a docker compose uh up to uh actually launch the wallet and then that's what it ends up looking like um you know once you're actually in the wallet you can create what we call an offer an offer is what you send to somebody to build a dlc uh, this again, going off our example earlier in the talk is uh, about the LA Pugba hackathon. Like you can set how much money you want to put in the, the DLC total. You can adjust the odds here. So going to our 
election example that I was talking about earlier, you know, maybe you want to sway the odds a little bit so the collateral isn't 50 50, but, uh, you know, you want one person to put in more money and another person to put in less. This is like the outcomes here that the Oracle can attest to, and then the amount of money that you'll get according to each outcome, the fee rate for the blockchain itself to get this confirmed. Um, this is like the selection process you can go through on the, uh, you know, adjusting the contract terms, if, if that's something you're interested in doing. Um, does this screen make sense or any questions that I can yeah, answer? So this is not like, you're not structuring the Bitcoin contract. This is just the signature for providing. But how does that fit into like the actual transaction that the chain is taking on? So the, the transaction, so the DLC actually has two stages. There's the funding transaction, which is uh, just a two of two multi-sig output between you and your counterparty. Um, also, as part of, uh, this is like what the actual negotiation process looks like for a DLT. The offer that we were creating on that last page is here. Um, the person that you're doing the DLT with would respond with this accept message. You'd find uh, Alice, the first person would send the sign message, and then you'd broadcast this funding transaction to the blockchain. So this funding transaction, um, well, okay, backing up here a little bit. The offer, like I said, contains all the contract details and Alice's like UTXOs that she's using to fund the DLC. Bob responds with a bunch of adapter signatures that represent each of those different possible outcomes that could um, happen in the DLC. So, you know, that means now Alice has all these adapter signatures that she knows she can go to the blockchain with in case the Oracle does attest to that. Alice now needs to respond to Bob with a bunch of or her own adapter signatures. So Bob also gets that guarantee that she can settle the bet um, in every different case that the Oracle can attest to. And then now since Alice has, uh, Bob has given Alice his adapter signatures, Alice has given Bob her adapter signatures and a funding signature is what Alice also gives in the sign message. Bob can go and broadcast this transaction to the blockchain, which is simply just the two of two multi-sig. Um, when the Oracle does come along and attests that you know Joe Biden won the election or the LA Rams won the Super Bowl, they can go and decrypt one of those adapter signatures that gives them a valid Bitcoin signature that they can go and settle and spend the money from this funding output. So um, a lot of information in there. Uh, question. So it feels like uh, like they're pre signed the transaction blocking the code. But then just have like an oracle who is also as part of that signing process. So then so they can be just one of the two or three. Just to just to um first like in this negotiation process, the Oracle is totally unaware of any of this happening. What um Alice had to do on this step here is go and get the Oracle from the Oracle Explorer, plug in all of the specific information that they want to bet on, like, you know, 50,000 Satoshi, you're putting in 25,000 stats, I'm putting in 25,000 stats. If, I, if the Oracle says, yes, this team won the LA Club by Hackathon, I'm getting 50,000 stats. And like, the Oracle doesn't care about any of that. They just, like... They, they don't know about any of this going on. And that's one of the beauties about DLCs is like the Oracle can be non-interactive during this entire process. Uh, it's nice from a scalability perspective so that you don't have another party to negotiate with and have things go wrong with. Um, and also it's great from a privacy perspective. Why should the Oracle know that I'm doing this contract? Like it's none of their business. I just want them to tell me if this team won the plug by hackathon, they shouldn't know if I'm betting 10K sats or 10 Bitcoin. Like, what's the difference to them? So we've like designed the DLC protocol to make sure that the oracles are as in the dark as possible. And, you know, with most things, scalability and privacy usually go hand in hand. And that's definitely the case in the DLC spec. Um, any follow-up questions there? Or? Yeah, yeah, my question. Just to make sure I it seems like it is similar yeah and uh, the, the funding process is very, very much the same yep um we do some a few little different things like those adapter signatures like i mentioned but 
you know, Lightning's got to exchange funding signatures as well. So that's definitely true. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what the adaptive signature looks like and then once the Oracle broadcast signature, how the future gets extracted on that and output and how the how you are going to be able to calculate how the exact um, you know, I would actually, I, I would defer to Nadav on this. Uh, the Oracle does reveal a secret. You go and decrypt one of the adapter signatures that you have stored. Like how you actually go and look up the adapter signature that's corresponding to the secret that the Oracle revealed. I don't know that off the top of my head. I would have to go look through the, the code base on that. And that's your specific question or, yeah. Um, yeah, we do still use ECDSA adapter signatures rather than Schnorr. We wanted to get this stuff out and not be waiting on Taproot essentially, because you know, at the time we didn't know when Taproot was going to get activated. Uh, so, but yeah, we I can I can follow up and send you links to that code too of how it works. Um, I can oh. wait until Taproot going up to Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's the negotiation process for a DLC. Uh, we do want to get DLCs onto Lightning. So kind of like what you were mentioning before, it's always been a goal of ours. Like there is trade-offs here and the design, I mean, we're still kind of looking through the, desi the designs, especially as Taproot is starting to get integrated into Lightning. Um, some of the considerations here is like, you know, direct channel DLC. So I'm just like directly connected to the person that I want to bet with versus routed DLCs where you route the entire DLC across the network is something that uh, is an open design question, I guess. Uh, I guess it is doable. The problem is how capital inefficient it is. So like imagine we've got like five hops in between us. That means every hop would have to lock up that amount of capital. and like say again, like we're doing a bet on the elections coming up this fall. Well, that's four months till those elections happen. So am I gonna lock up this capital for four months? Like that seems a little ridiculous. Uh, unfortunately, Lightning, as far as I'm aware, doesn't have a way to charge fees for the amount of time that a capital is locked, that the capital is locked up either. And in my opinion, that's a really big uh, limitation for the Lightning Network currently because uh, um, people also, yeah, I mean, you need some way to compensate these people for the amount of time that their capital is being used. For. Yeah, what's it called? Liquidity ads. Liquidity ads? <laughs> yeah, Sounds dumb. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, what, what's that? Also, true on Nagma. You can buy and put channels. Like, you can get a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. In liquidity ads for like routing across the entire network. Okay. Yeah, I guess that's like I, I think we're maybe we're talking about different things because you know I, I mean it, like I'm route routing from like Alice to Eve and there's like Bob, Carol, and Dave in between like and Bob, Carol, and Dave's liquidity is locked up for like three months. Then like they should. Be compensated for that, or they're going to be like, "Screw this! This is dumb." Uh, so you wouldn't want to do a DLC to fund a channel. You could do a DLC inside of a Lightning channel, though. And like, what I would encourage. Oh. I, I, I think. Um, you don't want to think of it as like a DLC is used to fund the channel. You you would take funds from the funding output in a channel and put it in a DLC. So replace this broadcast funding transaction here with an HTLC or PTLC that represents a DLC is what you'd really want to do. And then when the bets are done, you can just pull those funds back into the rest of your lightning channel and go about your no normal business once the, the DLC is done. So like, Maybe I have one Bitcoin total in my Lightning channel. I want to do a 0.1 DLC, 0.1 Bitcoin DLC on the election. The election expires. You know, uh, let's just say I won. Now I can go have that 1.1 1 .1 Bitcoin just in my Lightning channel that I can go and spend 
you know, wherever the heck I want, I guess, on other things. So it's like you use part of the amount of money you have in your Lightning channel to do a DLC, and then you can, you know, go do other things too with the remaining amount of capital in your, your Lightning channel. Um, does that make sense or did I lose you? No, I was, I was talking about you could uh, create a DLC where you're funding on chain and the result is a lightning channel. So you can really spend the amount on each side. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, 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 let's talk about it after this because I'm, I'm not sure if I, I'm, I'm following. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. If you guys want to read about like lightning DLCs, like go check out that mailing list post from Thibaut. He's a awesome open source DLC contributor from Japan. Um, if any of this stuff interests you, we have examples on our bitcoins.org website. We, there's an election example on there. There's a sports betting example. And then there's an example of doing financial derivatives with DLCs. So again, if you want to see these links, I posted these slides on my Twitter. Um, standardization process, again, it's open source. Like we care about trying to get you know, this collaborative community around DLCs. Those are the list of contributors that are currently uh, um, working on the DLC spec. And thank you. Uh, this is all my contact information. And I'm happy to do DLCs with people here if you, this is of interest to you. Um, yes. Uh, beyond, say, like betting on an election, uh, what are the bigger implications of DLCs? Like, you were well, I mean, I, I really think DLCs are interesting from like, a, you know, say you're a very large, like, you know, country like El Salvador, a very large Bitcoin whale, and you have certain like privacy constraints or you care about custody of funds, but you do also want to do risk management with your Bitcoin. DLCs are a great tool for this. So if you're El Salvador, you want to hedge some price risk relative to Bitcoin. While retaining custody of that Bitcoin, you can do this with uh, DLCs. That's like kind of the new toolkit that's available to you. It's like, you know, typically you see this as DeFi on other blockchains, but this is really bringing DeFi into Bitcoin in a way that's not like, I don't know, it doesn't have like the weird tokenomic stuff associated with it. It is strictly just access to risk management tools. And with any risk management tool, you've got to have a reason to apply that tool. You want to hedge some sort of risk and that gives you this now natively on Bitcoin. Does that mean good? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I remember a little bit like not much but like future future trading. Like that's kind of what this is, right? It's like the future trading that's coming for you can you can buy stuff in calls with the same you know. Yeah. Um, okay. and that's probably gonna be the main like use case for this because that's like what I th I think that's very fair. Yeah, I mean, like I don't, you know, I guess in Bitcoin, of course, we have natural producers of the commodity, which is miners, and like maybe they want they want to use something like this too because they're they're very likely want to hedge their price risk as we're seeing today. Like you know, Bitcoin's crazy. Right. <laughs> you should use sane risk management tactics, even though the entire ecosystem still is figuring this yeah. out. <laughs> they should be. In theory. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In the back. Yes. That's exactly right. It's a cash shuttle uh, contract. So the cash in this example is the native token itself to the Bitcoin network, Bitcoin. Well, is it, 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 I guess I'm using cash 
in this sense of like, say, take the CME's Bitcoin futures contract. Yeah. That's cash settled in USD, mm -hmm. right? So cash in this world means USD. However, on the Bitcoin blockchain, what cash means is Bitcoin itself and not the physical commodity like wheat or corn or whatever the heck you're hedging. Okay, I, done. Yep. Okay, thank you guys. Yeah. Yeah. All right, rock.